I waved to the guard like I belong here and cheerfully wished him good morning as I headed for the elevators. I got in and pressed the third floor button. When the door opened on the count of three, I quickly stepped out and headed straight for the employee bulletin board. I took a piece of paper out of my pocket and pinned it to the board with the buttons and then headed for the men's room. Once inside, I went into each of the four stalls and used a magic marker to write the same thing on all four walls of the stall. I went up the stairs to the fourth floor where I repeated what I had done on the third floor and then down the stairs to the lobby. I had a big smile on my face as I walked out the front door of the building, it's been said over and over again. Revenge is a dish best served cold. I never understood that saying. I could never figure out if it meant that you had to wait until the person you wanted revenge on forgot about you or if it meant that everything you did to get revenge had to be something cold-blooded, if it was the former, I didn't have the patience to wait that long. And if it was the latter, well, I guess you could consider what I just done, a very cold-blooded thing, and that was only half of it. The other half happened when I was sitting at my computer this morning. I figured that all hell would break loose around 10 in the morning, and it was convenient for me to take the day off work, so as soon as I got home having done my little thing, I picked up the phone, then with everything in place, I picked up a good book and settled down on the couch to enjoy a nice leisurely morning. It started out the way most of these things do, an unexpected afternoon drive home and finding a familiar car in the driveway, why would Brian come to my house in the middle of the day? The answer was obvious as soon as I crossed the threshold. Damn it, Marlene. You're so great, doesn't Robert turn you on anymore? Not often enough, honey, and nowhere near as good as you're getting, come on, love. We only have two hours before you have to leave. I couldn't believe it, it was a fucking cliché. My best friend had my wife and on top of that, she was telling him I wasn't worth a shit in bed. That really hurt. I always thought Marlene and I had a great sex life. Four or five times a week, and in these cases, it was more like twice, and then a quickie in the morning before I left for work. I think most men would have stormed into the bedroom screaming, ready to kick ass and yell, but I wasn't one of those men. My motto since eighth grade has been get mad, get even. I very quietly snuck into my home office and grabbed my mini dick to phone and a fresh tape. I crept as close to the bedroom door as I dared, opened the linen closet door and placed the recorder where it could best pick up the sounds from the bedroom and then quietly walked out of the house. When I got home that evening, Marlene was cooking dinner as usual, she had a fresh bottle of martini in the fridge, so we sat down, had our usual pre-dinner cocktail and chatted for a while. How was your day? honey. Full of the usual shitty meetings and conference calls, and how was yours, pretty boring. This morning, I went grocery shopping, did a bunch of laundry and then spent the rest of the day reading a book, anything interesting? No. Just one of those cheating stories from Nora Roberts. The usual story? Wife has a dirty affair with her husband's best friend. Yes. Pretty much. After dinner, I helped wash the dishes. Went to get my cassette recorder and then went to my home office to take care of some paperwork. I rewound the tape, pressed the play button, and then listened to my wife and my so-called best friend humiliate me between sex on the bed. What interested me most was how they had arranged their next meetings they planned to meet the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow was a day off. I had to get my hair done, you know, and Brian planned to spend two nights with Marlene when I went out of town a week. I wondered how he was going to pull it off without his wife finding out what he was up to. At any rate, judging from their conversation, this wasn't the first time Brian had kept Marlene company when I went out of town. Anyway, with that information in hand, I started planning. It's just amazing, the information you can find on the internet. Two hours of surfing, and I had almost everything I needed. A trip to Radio Shack and Electronics Avenue and a credit card helped me with the rest. I got home in the afternoon when I knew Marlene would be at the barbershop, and then using the information I'd gotten from the web and my purchases, hooked up the tape recorder to the phone line and hid the voice-activated recorder in the bedroom. 
The rest would have to wait until the weekend when Marlene would go to visit her mother and sister. That night, when I got home, I pulled the tape out of the tape recorder on the phone line and listened to a 10-minute conversation between Brian and Marlene in which they told each other how much they missed each other and could hardly wait until the next day when they could be in each other's arms again. The next day, while Marlene was doing the dishes, I took the tape out of the tape recorder in the bedroom and later in my office listened to it. Besides the sounds of sex, I got to hear the two of them talking about how stupid Bev and I, Brian's wife had been about how they had each other for over a year, and Bev and I had never found out. Brian spoke ill of Bev and said she was disgusting in bed. Marlene blew me away by pointing out all my faults, all lies, I swear, and then told Brian how happy she was to have him in her life. I put the tape away in a safe place and put a new one in the recorder. When I left for Seattle on Monday, my bedroom was wired for both images and sound. And I had three mini cameras installed that recorded everything that happened in the bedroom and transmitted it to three electronically controlled VCRs mounted in a cabinet in my office. A test run showed that as long as it was light in the room, I could get a decent picture. It was an expensive setup, but fortunately, I could afford it. Besides, it would pay off in that I wouldn't have to pay it off when it came time for a divorce. Motion sensors turned on cameras and cameras that turned on turned on VCRs. No motion for five minutes turned off the cameras, which in turn turned off the VCRs. When my flight took off, I was looking forward to watching some interesting footage when I got home. I would have been very angry if the rig hadn't worked. I waited until 10 p.m. to call Marlene because I knew from recorded conversations that Brian planned to be there by 7. Marlene answered the phone and she sounded a little out of breath. I asked her about it, and she said she was on her exercise bike in the basement and was talking to me on the wireless. In the middle of the conversation, I heard a sharp intake of breath and realized without a doubt that the recording would show Brian inserting his penis into Marlene at this point in the conversation. We talked for another minute or so, and then I told her that I loved her and that I missed her and she responded in kind. And I hung up. The next night's call was almost an exact duplicate of the previous one, except that I said I was going to be horny as hell when I got home. And Marlene said that was good because she planned to fuck me to death when I got home. And she did. That night, when I got home, I fell asleep completely exhausted. Marlene couldn't keep her hands off me, and I was almost tempted to ask her why she thought I was so bad in bed, but then that would have ruined the surprise. The next day, I went through the tapes in the three VCRs and found that I had some good footage, some really great footage, and a lot of crappy footage. But the most important thing was that I had enough good footage to work with. But I'm not done yet, not yet. For the next three weeks, the VCRs and cassette recorders would just turn on when Brian would come over and have fun with Marlene. On Saturday, when Marlene was visiting her mother and sister, I sat down, went through what I had and started working with it. I had some really great, almost professional porn quality material and by mixing it with just good material, I ended up with a video almost two hours long. I recorded a small tape that I was going to keep for myself. Most of the footage was just take it and have it, but what was most important to me was clarity. It was absolutely essential to my plan that I had plenty of footage with a clearly recognizable Brian and a clearly recognizable Marlene. The day I had been waiting for came and I packed copies of everything I had into two packages and then took them to the post office and mailed them. It was Saturday morning, and I requested a two-day delay from the post office so that the packages would be delivered on Monday. I then went home and put the rest of my plan into action. Two days later a couple of computer keystrokes and a visit to where Brian worked, and it was over. All I had to do was sit back and wait. Marlene came home from her weekly visit to the beauty parlor and was surprised to find me lying on the couch reading a book. She had some groceries with her and went into the kitchen to put them away. Honey, did you know the phone was disconnected? No, honey. I didn't know that. I must have turned it off while I was making myself a sandwich and didn't notice. No sooner had she put the receiver back on the lever than the phone rang. Hello? What? Are you sure? What are you going to do? Okay. 
I'm going to go take a look, where was that again? I heard her come out of the kitchen and head into the living room where we have the computer, about two minutes passed, and then I heard a sharp scream, I smiled to myself as Marlene watched her own porn video. Two minutes later, she burst into the room, you bastard. What have you done? I made you famous, honey, by now, your name should be on the rumor mill, at least among Brian's colleagues, it's probably unfortunate that he works for the company his father-in-law owns, but hell. According to him, Bev was a worthless wife anyway, so he won't miss her when she's gone, and I doubt he'd want to keep his job and run into his former father-in-law every day. On the other hand, he may not have any say in whether he stays or goes. It will probably depend on how the father-in-law feels when he opens the website and sees what Brian is saying about Bev. I looked at my watch, Bev should be opening her package right now, at least if the post office delivers it to Bev Street on time. A package what package? Nothing much. Just copies of all the recordings I've made of you and Brian over the last three weeks. Oh my god. How could you do this to me? It was easy, Marlene. All I had to do was remember you stabbing me in the back with a jerk who was supposed to be my best friend. The worst is yet to come for you. I'm guessing it won't be until half past six or six tonight. The phone rang and I said, or maybe sooner. Hello? Oh, hi, mom. What? I didn't hear another word, so I got up and followed her into the kitchen. She stood there with her face white as chalk while her mother talked on the other end of the wire. Is something wrong? I asked innocently, how could you send this to my parents in a package as an anniversary gift? Oh, come on, honey, at least I remembered their anniversary what else did you do? Posted your website address on the wall of every shitty establishment Brian works at along with the message for a nice time, call Marlene on the phone and wrote down your cell phone number. I also posted the same thing on all the bulletin boards there. Let's see. What else did I do? Oh, yeah. I sent an email to everyone in your address book. I wrote them, hey. Look at me new. And of course, there were attachments. I wish I could have been there to see your grandmother's face when she saw you begging Brian to fuck you. She stared at me for almost a full minute and then said, how can you hate me so much? It was easy, Marlene. All I had to do was watch the tapes and listen to what you said about me when you were with Brian. Speaking of Brian, Bev's probably already kicked him out the door. Call him. Maybe he'll let you live with him. What? Why would you say something like that? Why in God's name would I want to live with that jackass? I don't know, Marlene, but you're not staying here. I've caught your eye. I'm stupid, I'm no good in bed, and I'm not that good of a husband. I've got it all on tape, Marlene, so pack up your stuff and get out of here. Just then, the phone rang again. You'd better take the call it's probably your boyfriend wanting to cry on your chest. Marlene answered the phone and then held it out to me. This is for you. I picked up the phone and found it was Bev. I received an interesting package in the mail today. It didn't have a return address on it, but the contents made me think of you for some reason. Do you know anything about it? Guilty, I'm sorry if it upset you, but I had an uncontrollable urge to get a little revenge, don't apologize. I've suspected for some time that asshole was cheating on me, but I've never been able to prove it, thanks. I owe you one. What are you doing on your end? I looked at Marlene and said, she'll be out of here in an hour. I'm surprised you're giving her that much time. All I did was call the asshole and tell him not to bother coming home. Ever, my dad called me an hour ago and wanted to know what I wanted from him, so I told him and Brian is now among the unemployed, anyway, I owe you one. When the dust clears, I'll let you buy me a drink. Deal, I'll talk to you later. I hung up the phone and looked at Marlene, are you still here?